So he was four four. For he has something somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So the writer does not precisely locate his quotation, but contents himself with the general somewhere. Nor does he say who the speaker is, though once again it will be God, the author of all scripture. Locating a passage precisely was not easy when scrolls were used, and useless when it was important, there would be a tendency not to look it up. In the present case, the important thing is that God said the words, not where and when they were spoken. The passage speaks of God as resting from his work on the seventh day. It is worth noticing that in the creation story, each of the six days, the first six days, is marked by the refrain, and there was evening and there was morning. However, there is... This is lacking in the account in the seventh day. There we simply read that God rested from all his work. This does not mean that God entered a state of idleness, for there is a sense in which he continually is continually at work. John 5.17 But the completion of creation marks the end of a magnificent whole. Scroll back up there. It's magnificent whole. Sorry about that. The end of a magnificent whole. There was nothing to add to what God had done, and he entered a rest from creating, a rest marked by the knowledge that everything that he had made was very good, so we, we, we should think of the rest as something like the satisfaction that comes from the accomplishment, from the completion of a task, from the exercise of creativity. Let's move on to Hebrews 4.5. Here, Hebrews 4.5, and again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. So the writer adds a second quotation from Psalm 95.11. It is one that is central to his argument at this point, as here he often uses again where a further quotation is added to a preceding one. In this case, however, it does not does more than that. It introduces a second point in the argument. The first passage said that God rested, and by implication that the rest was open to those who would enter it. The second passage said that the Israelites did not enter that rest because God's judgment fell on them. So the way is prepared for later steps in the argument. So let's look at Hebrews 6 to 7. I'm putting the quote in, quotation in here to see if we can keep a handle on where the text is going. So now we're at 6 to 7. Therefore, since it remained for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, 7, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So the commentary says... It still remains, misses some of the force, the phrase it still remains, misses some of the force of the original, which is rather, since therefore it remains. The argument moves along in logical sequence. Some will enter that rest because it is unthinkable that God's plan should fail of fulfillment. If God prepared a rest for humanity to enter into, then they will enter into it. Perhaps those originally invited would not do so, as has been the case. For there is often something of the conditional about God's promises. This is not to say that one is to fear that these promises will not be kept. It is precisely the force of the present argument that nothing can stop the promises from being kept. But they must appear always be appropriated by faith. There is no other way of laying hold on them. So if one does not approach the promises by faith, he does not obtain what God offers and the offers made to others. In this case with Israel, in the case of Israel, to another generation of Israel. Some then must enter God's rest, but the first recipients of the good news did not. Way back in ancient times. What a shame. 
although many in the first century Hebrews and Jews uh, Jews uh, rejected that, but then they w went along with faith in Christ and became part of the body of Christ, the church. The writer concentrates on two generations only, the wilderness generation and his contemporaries. There had been other generations who might have appropriated the promise later on, but the focus is on the first generation who set the pattern of unbelief, and then on the writer's generation, Hebrews, book of Hebrews, who alone at that time had the opportunity of responding to God's invitation. All the intervening generations had ceased to be and could be ignored for the purpose of the argument. The reason for the first group did not enter God's rest was their disobedience. The word apatheia, disobedience, is always used in the New Testament of disobeying God, often with the thought of the gospel in mind. If they disobey the gospel, they don't believe. It's always used in the New Testament of disobeying God, often with the thought of the gospel in mind, so it comes close to the meaning of disbelief. It is disbelief, because the first generation had passed the opportunity by, God said another day. The idea that the wilderness generation was finally rejected was one of the rabbis found hard to accept. In their writings, we find statements such as the following, into this resting place they will not enter, but they will enter into another resting place. The rabbis also had a parable of the king who swore in anger that his son would not enter the palace. But when he calmed down, he pulled down his palace and built another, so fulfilling his oath and at that same time retaining his son. Thus the rabbis expressed their conviction that somehow those Israelites would be saved. No, later generations would. One later generation, when Christ comes again in the second coming. The author, however, has no such reservations about the wilderness generation. They disobeyed God and forfeited, forfeited their place. Psalm 95 was written long after that generation had failed to use its opportunity and had perished. Its use on the term of the term today shows that the promise had never been claimed and was still open. The voice of God still called. The author had already has already used the quotation in 3:7, but its point this time is the word today. There is still a day of opportunity, even though the fate of the wilderness generation stands as an impressive witness to the possibility of spiritual disaster. And we have 4.8. The form of the Greek sentence indicates a contrary to fact condition. Let me put that in there. So 4.8. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In the form, the form of the Greek sentence indicates a contrary to fact condition. If Joshua had given them rest, as he did not, God would not have spoken later about another day as he did. The name Joshua is the Hebrew name form for of the Greek name Jesus. Joshua is a good way of rendering the text, as it makes clear to the English reader who is in mind. The Greek text, however, says Jesus and both the writer and his original readers would have been mindful of the connection with the name of Christ, even though the emphasis in the passage lies elsewhere. There had been a Jesus who could not lead, who could not lead his people into the rest of God, just as there was another Jesus who could. And verse 9, the sentence, let me put 9 up here. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So Hebrews 4.9, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The sentence begins with the inferential ara. So, as a result, what follows is the logical consequences of what precedes. The term Sabbath rest is not attested before this passage and looks like the author's own coinage. 
He did not have a word for the kind of rest he had in mind, so he made one up. There were various kinds of rest. There was, for example, the kind Israel was to get in its own land, when it had rest from wars. When the psalmist wrote Psalm 95, he knew firsthand what this kind of rest in Palestine meant, and he still looked for rest. So this is not what the author of Hebrews had in mind. Buchanan has a long note on, on rest in what he surveys a number of opinions and rejects all spiritualizing interpretations. He thinks that many scholars read their own ideas into rest, and he thinks it's impossible for the word to be used in a non-national, non-material sense. They were ex probably expecting a rest that was basically of the same nature as Israelites had anticipated all along, but surely the blessings in this temporal life. But surely this is precisely what the author is rejecting. He knew that Israel had been in its own land for centuries. There had been quite long periods of peace and independence, yet the promise of rest still remained unfulfilled. Jesus spoke of quite another kind of rest, the rest for the souls of men. This is nearer to what the author means. We might also notice an idea of the rabbis. The Mishnah explains the use of Psalm 92, a song for the Sabbath. In these terms, a song, a song for the time that is to come. For the day that will be shall be all Sabbath and rest in the life everlasting. This is in the Talmud. This is the kind of rest the author refers to, though his idea is not a rabbinic one. He links rest with the original Sabbath, with what God did when he finished creation, and what Christians are called into. This, then, is a highly original view, not simply an idea of refurbished the idea, the author sees the rest as for the people of God, an expression found elsewhere in the New Testament only in 1125, though 1 Peter 2.20 is similar, and expressions like my people occur several times. Have to be careful of the context. In the Old Testament, the people of God is the nation of Israel, but in the New Testament, it signifies believers in the church age. The rest the author writes about is for such people. Others cannot enter into it. This is not so much on account of the law or rule denying them entrance as that they shut themselves out by disobedience, meaning unbelief. Hebrews 4.10 For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. So in 10 we have the commentary. We now have a description of at least part of what the rest means. The writer reverts to the word for rest he has been using earlier instead of the Sabbath rest, to enter rest means to cease from one's own work, just as God ceased from his. There are certain uncertainties here. Some think the references to Jesus, who would certainly fit the description except for the anyone, which is a reasonable interpretation of the Greek. But the general reference is there, and we must take it to refer to the believer. The question then arises whether the rest takes place here and now, or after death, as seen in Revelation 14.13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Bruce thinks it is an experience which they do not enjoy in their present mortal life, although it belongs to them as an heritage, uh, heritage and by faith they may live in the good of it here and now, in temporal blessings. I should reverse his order and say that they live in it here and now by faith. But what they know here is not the full story. That will be revealed in the hereafter. There is a sense in which the to enter Christian salvation means to cease from one's works and rest securely on what Christ has done, definitely. And there is a sense in which the works of the believer, works done in Christ, have about them that completeness and sense of fulfillment that may fitly be classed with the rest in question. All right, little notes here on the text. Little extra detail. Point D, exhortation to enter the rest. Hebrews 4, 11 to 13. The idea of rest is simply, of God, is not simply a piece of curious information not readily accessible to the rank and file of Christians. It is, is a, it is a spur to action. So the writer proceeds to exhort his readers to make that rest their own. Right there in the epistles. The Word of God are the instructions. More on this next time.